All right, I think we're uh, we're going to get started here. Um, sorry about the the little bit of delay. Uh, we've got uh, we had a little technical difficulty. We had to work out making sure that we were getting sound working for those that are uh, joining us at home. Um, Please understand, obviously, with technology, we know that there could be some, some things coming up um, as we're going through this, so please bear with us. We're gonna do the best that we can. We've got our, our wonderful uh, partners, uh, the staff from the library here that are, uh, are supporting us and uh, helping us out with the technology and all that stuff. So we're ever grateful for them. So first of all, I wanna give a round of applause to them for hosting us and everything. So we appreciate it. We appreciate them so much and everything that they do for us. Uh, so for everyone to know, I know there's a lot of questions that have come up with this um, and us hosting this uh, this presentation. Uh, we do have this, not only did are we doing this in person and the option to, to watch for some people at home, um, we are recording this session as well and we plan to make it available uh, through our Mount Prospect uh, television channel as well, as most likely we're probably gonna be hosting this again, just because again, it is great information. We wanna make sure that it's available out there for everyone. Um, so I'm just gonna quickly introduce uh, who I've brought with me from the police department, who you're going to hear from tonight besides myself. Uh, so with me, I have uh, school resource officer, Detective Lisa Shapps here. Uh, oh. <laughs> you get an applause, all right. <laughs> um, we also have uh, Sergeant Bart Tweedy. He's the administrative sergeant in charge of training. And we also have our community relations officer, Mark Bechtold. And uh, my name is Greg Sill, and I'm the crime prevention officer here with the Mount Prospect Police Department. Oh, no. <laughs> Maybe I should announce my name again. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so uh, we're going to go ahead and get started with the presentation. Um, this is a, a lot of good information that we have out there. Um, we're going to try and share it. There is so much information that we can talk about tonight. Um, but obviously, while we want to get out the good information, we also want to be cognizant of people's time. Um, and we want to be aware of that. What we're going to ask to try and keep um, the time moving and everything, what we're going to ask is that uh, we hold any questions, whether they be in person here or at home uh, till the very end. Uh, we do have a, a little bit of time at the end that we're going to allow for questions. Um, we know that there probably are a lot of questions. So please understand that um, if we don't get to your question before the time runs out, we're not going to be out the door as soon as we're done. We're going to we're going to make sure that we're, we're allowing you to ask questions. Um, if I forget to say it at the end, if you're at home and you have questions and you're, you chat the question in and it does not get answered or addressed, don't worry, we're not going to forget about you. We're not going to say that we're never answering your question. We want to make sure that we can get that information to you as well, because again, it's all about information sharing. So I'm just going to quickly go ahead. Um, hold on. Oh, okay. I'm going to go ahead and enable that. Hopefully, hopefully that'll be. Yep. Uh, all right. I'm going to try and hide this as well. So again, like I said, bear with us. Um, all right. So uh, just a really quick disclaimer about this presentation. Uh, obviously, with the topic, um, we're talking about something that is um, a very, very uh, important topic, but obviously very sensitive in the nature of what we're talking about. So um, we do have a content warning up here, knowing that, um, you know, again, it's it's going to be presented to, uh, to you guys. Uh, it's not necessarily made or geared down towards younger audiences or anything like that. So for anyone that is watching at home, uh, please understand that um, there are, in this presentation, we do have a video that we're going to be showing. Um, it is, it does have some, uh, again, tense situations and everything. Um, we understand that. We want to make sure that you guys understand that as well. Also, uh, as we present, what you'll also see is you might find that as we're presenting, uh, we might bring try and bring a little levity to it. Um, just because we see, uh, we as we've done this presentation, we can kind of read the room a little bit too and realize that it is a really tense topic. And sometimes we do need to bring that that levity into it a little bit. It's not to be, it's not to offend anyone or anything like that. It's really just to kind of break that tension. Um, because again, like I said, we know it's a tense topic and all that stuff. So please don't take it as us just thinking that it's not important or anything like that. This topic is obviously very, very important to us, to our community. So just so people know that there is going to be that that uh, again content that coming in. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to try and hide this uh, panel again really quickly. Um, so what we're going to do is uh, I'm, I just want to define 
uh, what is what we're talking about tonight. And I think everyone kind of knows what we're talking about, but I just wanted to define it just so everyone knows. You're gonna, you might hear some different terminology that's being used. Um, the, the main terminology that you heard was uh, active threat was on the, on the screen, um, active killer, active shooter. Um, the reason why we talk about the different terms, the reason why we talk about it is because a lot of times we focus in on gun violence, um, but please understand that this is uh, this is information that really can be used uh, for any type of situation where you have someone that's actively coming to a location looking to hurt people, looking to to take people's lives. Um, usually, they look at a more of a confined space or more of a space where they're going to find multiple people or chances for multiple victims. So that's what we're talking about here. So again, if you hear any of us using the different terms, active shooter, active killer, active threat, um, that type of stuff. Um, that is all just the same as we go through this. So again, just kind of trying to define that so everyone knows exactly what we're talking about. I'm going to pass the microphone off to uh, Officer Bechtold here. Okay, thank you very much, Greg. Appreciate that. So before I get started with this, I just want to personally thank all of you for being here tonight. What a privilege is to, privilege to speak to all of you tonight. And it means so much that you are making this a priority and you see the need for this. Uh, it's not an exaggeration to say that potentially tonight, you being here, you learning these things could save lives. It could save your lives. It could save coworkers' lives, your family's lives. I mean, it's that serious of an ordeal right now. So I'm so thankful that you are taking time out of your schedule and your lives to be here in person or to be watching online. So thank you very much for doing that. Uh, we're going to talk about here initially is the psychological instincts that you hear about, fight or flight. So usually these are the two we think about, fight or flight, but I want you to introduce something else, that there's not just these two to worry about, but there's a third one, fight, flight, or freeze. And so that's the reason I'm giving my portion of this, is to avoid that third one. I don't want you freezing in a situation a drastic situation, a dangerous situation, then I want you to be able to, to fight or I want you to be able to, to flee. And those are the things that we're gonna talk about tonight. That's all right. Okay, so tonight, this, to avoid this freeze, what we're talking about is options that you have. And I wanna equip you with options that you have so that you are able to withstand one of these situations to be able to get out, get to safety, or to be able to fight accordingly. So we have the main three options here. We're looking at running, hiding, and fighting. And we're gonna get into these, and I'm gonna show a video that's gonna give some context to these. But you're gonna hear some of these other words like Greg talked about, and they kind of mean the same thing. First one, we got the running, escaping, evading, avoiding. These are things that we're gonna be encouraging you to do, and you'll see this in the video. Second one is words associated with hiding. And then finally, the, it's gonna be fighting back. And so right now I'm gonna take a couple minutes to show you this video, add some context to this, and then uh, you'll be able to, uh, we'll talk a little bit about it after. There's a gunman inside the store. We need help now. Mm -hmm. about is the new system, isn't it? What's going to be the solution by the time we? All right, thank you. Appreciate it. Actually, think he's got an old. Well, he's got a truck. I don't know if your daughter would be interested. Yep. 
Um, we need help. There's a gunman inside the store. He's shooting the place up. We need help now. Issues that we found. Okay, Emily, see what that is. See what's going on. Just let us know what you're talking about. Like there you go. Okay, here's a second for that. This guy with a gun is shooting. Look, James, what do I do? No, right, right, right. To the right, to the right, to the warning now. Come on, this way, this way, this way. Oh, no, come in. Yeah, in here, in here. The government's coming. What are we going to do? We're going to have to defend ourselves. You're going to see your daughter tonight, okay? We are all going to go home tonight, all right? We have a right to defend ourselves. Get the gun! Get the gun! Hey! Yes, we're all going to go home. Everybody's going home. If you ever have the misfortune to be in an active shooter event, you deserve to survive. In our research, we have found that the actions that potential victims take during these events are critical to their survival. We have identified three options that have proven effective in many events. These are avoid the attacker, deny the attacker access to your area, Defend yourself. It is a personal decision, but you have a right to do so. Avoiding the attacker starts with being aware of your surroundings at all times and knowing what is going on around you. If you see or hear something that looks suspicious, take action. For example, the stalker took immediate and effective action to protect himself when he observed the shooter pulling out weapons from the bag. Others, however, hesitated, and this hesitation can cost them valuable time that they couldn't use to get away from the threat. If you hear something that is or could be gunfire, start trying to get away from it as soon as possible. Gunfire has a distinctive sound. Inside of buildings, the sound can be muffled or distorted. A single loud bang could be a person dropping something, or even thunder. But repeated loud bangs are much more likely to be gunfire. Additionally, look at the reaction of others. Are they startled or scared? Are they running? What are they saying? Any one of these events individually may create denial, but when put together, should create a heightened awareness and stimulate an immediate response. It is important that you know how to get out. The situation will be chaotic and rapidly changing. In general, you will want to go to the nearest exit. 
But you must also understand that the closest exit may not be accessible or safe to use. If this is the case, go to a different exit. While avoiding the threat, consider the uses of cover and concealment. Cover offers protection from gunfire while concealment minimizes your exposure to the attacker. Try to keep objects between you and the attacker. If you can't avoid the attacker, sometimes the best option will be to deny the attacker access to your location. In many locations, this can be accomplished by closing and locking a door, such as they did in the meeting room. Locking the door has proven effective in many attacks. If the door does not have a lock, you can place heavy objects in front of it. Remember, barricades work best if the door opens toward you. If it doesn't, use things that are readily available, such as straps, belts, or objects that can be used to block or secure the door to make it difficult for the attacker to enter the room. This may at least slow the attacker down and give you time to identify alternate means of escape, such as adjoining rooms or windows. When attempting to deny access to your location, you wanna make it appear that there is no one in your area. Lock doors, turn off the lights, silence your phones and get out of sight. Your attempt to deny the attacker access to your location might fail. The government's coming. What are we gonna do? We're gonna to have to defend ourselves. Have a backup plan about what you will do. In many cases, this may be to defend yourself. You need to be in a place where you can act if the attacker comes into your location. In most rooms, you will line up against the same wall that the door is on, near the door so you can react, but not directly in front of it. If you are unable to avoid or deny, your best option may be to defend yourself by using whatever is available. In a situation where someone is attempting to kill you, you have the legal right to defend yourself. Attack weak spots such as eyes, throat, and groin. Fight to the best of your ability and do not quit until the attacker is stopped. Get the gun. This is what the workers in the warehouse did when they were unable to avoid the attacker and felt their lives were in immediate danger. Whatever option you choose, call 911 as soon as you are in a safe location. Provide any information that you know. The operator will ask you a lot of questions. If you don't know the answer, don't guess. Just say you don't know and only state the facts. This will be a complex situation and we can't tell you what you should do in every case. What we can do is provide you with information about the options that we have found to be most effective for surviving these attacks. The ultimate choice is yours. What you do matters. Avoid the attacker. Deny access to your location. Defend yourself. Law enforcement will be entering a chaotic scene with limited information. Their first priority will be to stop the threat to your safety. The police may not know where or who the threat is. Listen and comply with their commands immediately. Put it down. Put it down, sir. Put it down. Both of you on the ground. Police are trained to look at people's hands to assess threats. Do not have anything in your hands that could be perceived as a weapon, such as a cell phone. Show me your hands, sir. Show me your hands. Move to us. Everybody, keep your hands up, please. Walk out the door. If told to do so, stay where you are and do not make sudden movements. Again, follow all commands. Remember. What you do matters. Avoid the attacker. Deny access to your location. Defend yourself. Remember, A-D-D, -D, you can survive. Okay. So just wanna highlight a couple of those, uh, all three of those points about avoiding, denying, and defending yourself. 
highlight a few things of those for you to uh, go away here with. Uh, the first one, that idea of avoidance, that is the goal, to get out. Uh, part of what is involved with avoidance is keeping your head on a swivel, paying attention. When you walk into a place, when you walk into a business, a movie theater, you're looking where exits are. Because by being proactive in this, you're avoiding some of these situations to begin with. You need to observe people to become a people watcher. When you see someone that comes in, it's the middle of summer and they're wearing a long coat. That's maybe something to be suspicious about. Or if it's winter time and the person is sweating uh, extensively and maybe their eyes are darting back and forth, they're just signs to be aware of that that doesn't look right. So these are things that when you're observant and you're paying attention, that will help you in avoiding. Being aware of your surroundings. Who are you gonna lean on in a crisis? There's such a thing as positive profiling. When you go in there, you think, okay, that person looks like they can take care of themselves. If something goes down, I'm tapping them on the shoulder and we might be the ones that defend everyone here. So you're paying attention to that, people that you can call on. Lisa's gonna get into some of this avoidance stuff later on, but as we go from avoidance, then we go into this whole idea of denying. Denying people, is your main thing here is to stay alert, uh, keep the offender away from you. The first one, you're staying away from the offender, but now if you have no choice, you do everything in your power to keep the offender away from you. Become that hard target. And then finally, defending yourself. If it comes down to it, I'm not telling you to do it, but I'm saying that you have the permission and you have the right to defend yourself. And like they talk about, this is not fair fighting. You do everything in your power. You take cheap shots, you bite, you slip, you slap, you kick, you do everything in your power to defend yourself in that moment if it comes down to it. I think of the movie, the 1517 to Paris. It talks about the four people that uh, stopped the terrorist on that attack of that train going to Paris. They stopped someone that had a rifle and a pistol and they were unarmed when they did, were able to stop him. And there's a story in that movie, it's a true story about one of the guys who when he was uh, in school at this military school, the alert went off for an active shooter on campus. So the instructor said, okay, everybody get underneath the tables, lock the door. So they did this except this one guy, Spencer Stone. He looked around, all he had was a pen. He grabbed a pen, put it in his hand, and he stood next to the door, ready in case someone came through that door to defend himself and others. It ended up being a false alarm and nothing came of it. The teacher asked him, Spencer, why did you avoid my commands? Why didn't you do what everyone else said? He said, ma'am, I just didn't want my family to know that I died hiding underneath a table. So I am giving you the permission to defend yourself if it comes down to it. So just to recap what we're doing here in these situations, you are avoiding, you are denying entry, and you are defending yourself. I want you to take 10 seconds now, look around, and I want you to shout out what are some things that you could use in this room if someone were to break in right now to defend yourself. Chairs, what else? Keys, cell phone, right. You got pens, sure. We got these TV monitors. Yes, cords. All right, so. <laughs> yes, for our online audience, someone offered up their wife. So I just thought you'd like to know that. But great job just in those few seconds you're able to articulate some things that you can use to defend yourself in case of an emergency so keep those things in mind be observant when you go into these places this unfortunately is the reality now i'm going to hand it over to sergeant tweedy and he's going to share the next part of the program all right outstanding so we're, I'm gonna talk a little bit here about uh, cover and concealment, a uh, couple different things. So we talked about our uh, run, hide, fight, or avoid, uh, deny, defend, correct? If we're gonna uh, shelter ourselves in that room and we're gonna deny that uh, attacker access, we need to know some things about how bullets travel and what's gonna protect us. So we have two different things. We have cover and we have concealment. Easiest way to remember this is cover is gonna stop that bullet from coming through and give you ballistic protection. Concealment is gonna conceal you from the attacker, but won't necessarily stop bullets. So to give you an example, cover would be something 
uh, like a, a brick wall, cement, something heavy duty, uh, parts of your car can work as cover. Uh, the, uh, the support pillar in the back of the room there, uh, made out of cement supporting the, uh, the structure of the building, that's gonna be a solid object that's gonna give you some, uh, some defense from that round coming through. Things that are not gonna stop bullets are uh, the glass doors that we have in the room, uh, your standard uh, house or building wall, that's gonna be uh, two sheets of uh, drywall with a little bit of insulation and some uh, uh, wood framing in the middle is not gonna stop bullets. They're gonna pass right through. Um, I'm trying to think of another good example, but that's probably our best example to think about it would be a house. If you're uh, hiding behind a, a, a bush or something like that, that will conceal it from the shooter, but it won't necessarily stop those bullets from coming through. So that's something we wanna keep in mind when we're uh, concealing ourselves. Now we want to talk about what are we as the police going to do when we get there? So they touched on it in the video, but just to expand out a little bit more. Uh, job number one for our officers when they get that call is to get to that scene as quickly as possible. They're going to deploy with the uh, necessary equipment. They're going to get into uh, that building or that area, and they're going to find that, uh, that killer as quickly as possible. Priority number one for all our police, uh, how we handle it is we take all our available resources. We dump them to the scene as quickly as possible. And what we would refer to as anybody familiar with military tactics, it would be a swarm tactic every different direction as quickly as we can. We try to get in there and our officers are gonna to move to the sound of that gunfire. Job number one and the only job for those officers until uh, we say otherwise is we're gonna get in and stop that attacker from harming anybody else. Uh, a lot of these attacks are over within a matter of just a few minutes. So it's uh, incumbent on our officers to make sure we get there as quickly as possible and we uh, stop that shooter. That could be anything from us uh, killing or wounding that attacker so they can no longer harm anybody else, uh, getting them to surrender and taking them into custody or if we can isolate them to a location where they are no, not able to escape or we can cover the avenues of escape with police officers and they're not able to injure anybody else, those are all viable alternatives. But job number one for us. So what does that mean if you're in the building when we get there? Uh, you may be hiding, you may be scared, you may be ready, uh, see the police officers and think uh, it's all over, we're, uh, we're safe, we're good to go. Uh, you may be injured, um, could be any number of things but we want to make you mentally prepared that we are going to bypass you and we're going to move on so we can stop that threat so we can stop anybody else from being injured. All right, getting on to a little bit of the follow-up from that. So our, our units that initially get there, we're going to find that, uh, that killer and we're going to stop them from harming anyone else. Once that is done so, either we have successfully stopped that, uh, that active shooter from harming anyone, anyone else, or we have enough resources available to deal with the, uh, the active shooter threat. Then our, our second mission or our second uh, goal of the, uh, of the situation is to save as many lives as possible. And how do we do that? And that, that's with cooperation with our fire department. So if we remember when these started uh, a couple decades ago, when we unfortunately started with some of these active shooter incidents, our fire departments wouldn't come up with us. They would stay staged at an outside area. Our officers would have to come in, stop that shooter, find the casualties, do a search, usually do another search, make sure that scene is perfectly secure before the firewind would come forward. We no longer use that model. We found that uh, lives are being lost and people aren't being saved because of that. So we use what's called the rescue, rescue task force model. So what that means is we take additional police uh, resources, police officers, we uh, pair them up with our firefighters. Our firefighters have uh, ballistic helmets and ballistic vests that they wear into the scene and we bring them into that zone. Now that shooter may still be roaming in the building, but we have enough officers to deal with that threat We'll bring additional officers in with those firefighters so we can get on and we can treat casualties. Um, what those firemen are going to do is they're going to prioritize who they should treat. They're going to look at everybody who was wounded. Uh, they're going to decide, is this, unfortunately, is this person savable? They have to take kind of a combat mindset to this, which is a, a hard reality, but that's what we have to do. We, their job is to get in there and save the one they can. They're going to evaluate, is this a serious life-threatening injury that we need to address immediately? Or is this a minor injury that we can let go for a little while so we can move on to the more serious injuries? If it's a serious injury, it's generally gonna be some type of bleeding. We need a hemorrhage control. Uh, if anybody's got a medical background, bleeding is one of the biggest things that's gonna to lead to death. And there's not a lot of time with that once you initially start the bleed. So they're gonna come in, they're gonna stop that bleeding and that hemorrhage control. And then they're gonna they're gonna leave that uh, wounded person there and they're gonna move on. Those initial uh, fire department units, those RTF teams are gonna come in they're gonna stop the bleeding and as many people as they possibly can till they either get to everybody or they run out of medical gear, uh, whatever comes first. And then they're gonna have follow on teams that are gonna come in and then start extracting the worst casualties first. So you may have been uh, wounded in this situation, shot through the calf, something minor, uh, where it's not a life-threatening injury, 
you may have to wait a while until they can get through and they can get to more serious injuries. They can treat those injuries. They can extract those injuries and they, um, then they will move on to the, the lesser injuries. They have a whole uh, coding system. It's uh, it's fascinating to watch. They're a, a well-oiled machine when they do this, how they uh, categorize people, how they make sure the follow-on units know what category this casualty has been categorized at, how they treat these injuries. Um, it is a, uh, they are a group of professionals out there that really do some great work when I got an opportunity to watch them do this. So that's how we will handle these situations. Then on the police end, if you're sheltered in place, it's going to be a little while till we get to you. We have to find that shooter, stop that shooter from doing any additional casualties. Then we need to bring on the uh, the fire department to get out there to treat everybody who is injured. And then what we will do then is our police units will go around and we'll do a secondary search of the building. What we're looking or a building or open area, whatever it might be. We're looking for any additional threats. Could be another shooter, could be bombs, booby traps, any other type of device like that. And we're looking for any injured people that we might have missed. Maybe somebody was shot and crawled into a closet to hide. We want to make sure we find all of those people as quickly as possible. So if you're sheltered in place and you're unhurt, we are going to leave you where you are and we're going to move through and we're going to look for additional threats and additional casualties. Once that secondary search is done, we're going to move on to a tertiary search. Uh, with that tertiary search, that'll be the time when we're going to start evacuating people out and figuring out where we want to direct you towards so we can, so we can bring you out there. So if you see the police and you see us coming in, we know our job and we know it well, but I just want to assure all of you that we will get to you. It just might uh, not be as quickly as you hope. Uh, we just have to prioritize what our task list is because we have a lot of jobs to do with uh, limited resources. Uh, big question we get with us at the police department is, are we ready? Are we prepared for this if, the, if we have the unfortunate instance where this happens? And I can tell you, yes, we are. This has been something we've been uh, talking about and uh, training with at the police department for almost my entire 20 years that I've been with the department. Um, I have a dedicated group of uh, range staff that is experienced in how to run these uh, these scenarios and these training sessions. Uh, you really need a, a dedicated and experienced instructor cadre to effectively pull off this type of training for a police department. And I am blessed to have uh, quite a few of those um, officers with me. And we are really able to do put together some top level training for our officers because of that. Um, we've uh, we'll bring our new officers on. We'll get them trained up. And we try to do training on a regular basis. Our uh, last training, I don't know if anybody might have seen on our social media, as we had the uh, the privilege of using our AMC theaters up at Ranhurst Mall. Um, essentially what we do with our training is we're gonna try to put our officers in the situation as close to real as we can possibly get it. So what that means is we put our officers in the squads with all their duty gear, with the, uh, the weapons that they would use. And all we do is we change out the bolt of the weapon so we're shooting blanks instead of real bullets. Uh, we have role players that we put inside the theater uh, we had structured scenarios with different learning objectives that we want the officers to hit. Uh, we put uh, the fire department stage dummies inside the various parts of the theater to act as casualties. We brought on members of our uh, community emergency response team that volunteered their time to come out and act as uh, additional uh, people inside the scenarios, as well as some of the civilian employees of our police department. And we went out there and we ran a full like we would, like it, like it was for real. So I dispatched the officers over the radio. They responded. They have to decide where they're going to park, what equipment do they need, are they going to pair up with a partner, and they deploy into that building in ones and twos to look for uh, that shooter. Then we have the fire department units come on. We tested our communication plan, we tested our command and control plan, our unified command with the fire department, and I can tell you, it worked exceptionally well. We asked a lot of our officers and our firefighters that were out there. Our officers ran for uh, several of them in the back that went through the training. We ran a good, probably six or seven hours of straight instruction on this. We'd run a scenario, we'd stop. I'd bring them back, we'd reload the weapons, re everything, and get them back out there again. And my goal in doing that in training is to try to induce as much stress as I can, mental and physical fatigue. Uh, we skip lunch and we work through lunch, and we ran about six or seven hours straight. We ran five continuous scenarios. And I really, we uh, really, as instructors and trainers, we asked a lot of our officers and uh, for them to perform under stress, and they performed admirably. So we can say with confidence, we at the police department, and I can speak for the Mount Prospect Fire Department as well, we are prepared if Unfortunately, this happens, we will respond effectively. All right. Missed my cue. There we go. All right. So the, the question always comes up as we're we're talking through this. Um, 
you know, how do we know that something's going on? How, how do I know? What am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to react to every little sound? Um, and this is where it comes to really trusting your instinct, taking in the information that you have, um, figuring out what's going on based on that information. We always fall back on safety first, right? That's something that we can always go back on and we want to be safe. So how do we know that something's going on? In the video, they talked about how loud noises could be something, someone dropping something, anything like that. But they gave you that, that instinct of, hey, if something doesn't seem right, if there's something in your gut feeling telling you that something's just not right here, we're going to go and make and take steps towards moving to somewhere where we can get out, somewhere where we can find cover or concealment, um, so we can go ahead and react to that. And really, that's what talking about, uh, you know, being aware of what's going on and being aware of your surroundings. I don't know how many of you guys, when you walked into the room, did anyone look and say, how would I get out of here in the event that there was an emergency, right? So we're encouraging you, and I see some people pointing, so thank you, awesome, right? So... Um, this is something that we encourage, right? We encourage when you go places, when you, you know, we get into that na natural human behavior of we're going through the routine, right? We all have our routine. We all have our places that we go. We're encouraging you take a moment to look around, take a moment to say, Hey, in the event that there was something going on, whether it's a active shooter type event, whether it's a fire, whether it's severe weather, anything, we're trying to get that mindset of being prepared, right? We're getting out of that freeze mentality. We want to start moving towards making those critical thoughts or critical decisions based on that information that we have. So that's what we're talking about. How do we know what's going on? We might not know. We might be able to see we're in the grocery store, right? And all of a sudden we see people starting to run through the grocery store. I don't think it's because they just got a sale on something in the produce department, right? It, we're taking in that information and going, something doesn't seem right here. How are we going to take that information and how are we going to make a decision to decide what we're going to do, how we're going to act, what we're going to do? That's what we're looking at doing. That's what we're trying to encourage here as well. How do we let others know? Are we going to hear something over a loudspeaker? Does every place that we have have a way to page out? Probably not, right? I know I've been in a lot of businesses and a lot of restaurants and everything here in Mount Prospect. I can tell you, not all of them have a way to make an announcement over them. That's just not the business that they're in. So is it going to be people yelling? Is it going to be people not just running past you? Is it going to be, you know, you're going to see something that, again, just something doesn't seem right. Do we have to? Is there a requirement that I have to notify people? When we saw that, when we saw that uh, soccer for the, for the, uh, in the, store did did he go and say hey guys come on come on come on come on he didn't now is he at fault for that no again we have to make sure we're we're keeping safe if we can if that's something that you choose to do and you say hey come with me come on come on that's great you can do that um if you have that person that you're like come on come on come on and they're not moving there might be a time where you might have to say I need to keep moving. I can't stay here and try and get that person to come with me. But as of what you're required to do, um, you're, you're not required to go and try and make some announcement or anything like that. How do we let others know? All of us, most, I shouldn't say all of us, but probably most of us carry cell phones, right? Can we let people know by calling 911 when it's safe to do so, right? We want to be able to have that ability. We want to make sure we do that. And then the question always comes up. I always get this question. What if I'm wrong? What if I heard something and I reacted and I did something or I tried to get other people to move and I'm wrong? Again, we fall back on that safety is the most important thing, right? And if you're wrong, that's something that we can go and say, okay, hey, you know what? This is what happened. This is what we information we have. And that person was being safe, right? But if there's if we're not, if we don't react and we're wrong and or we're we're not wrong, I should say, and we don't react, it could be costly to us, our lives, or someone else's. So we're encouraging people, pay attention to where you're at. Look for those exits. Um, when we've seen stuff happen in uh, movie theaters, we've seen fires and things happen in movie theaters, and everyone tries to go out that back exit, right? The one that they come into the movie theater in. And they always try and go back out that same exit when they're sitting right next to an emergency exit. It's that situational awareness that we want to try and encourage everyone. We want people to start looking around. So in your, in your personal lives, when you go out, when you're going to the store, when you're going to restaurants, when you're going to your workplace, schools, wherever, take a moment and just say, hey, if I needed to get out of here for whatever reason, how would I do that? What steps would I take? And that pre-planning is so important when we're talking about um, surviving these types of incidents. That going to work again? There we go. Um, so some things to know, some things just to kind of recap and, and be aware of, right? Again, aware of your surroundings. Hey, maybe I want to go out this door, but maybe I've looked before and there is 
um, you know, there's something that's dangerous out there. There's a bunch of thorny bushes, right? And I might not want to go out that way. I don't know. Again, these are things going into a closet where they've got uh, hazardous materials or something like that might not be the best option, right? So this is where, as you're going around, you can start kind of keeping an eye on and paying attention, right? We talked about taking note of the uh, nearest exits calling or texting 911 when it's safe to do so. So I don't know if everyone in here knows this or everyone at home knows this, but in Mount Prospect, we are a community where you can text to 911. So where that's really important, so I will tell you, let me back up really quick. So the preference when we call, when we reach, to, reach out to 911, anytime you need a police officer to come to where you're at here in Mount Prospect, it is done through our 911 dispatch center. So it is done by calling 911. And I know for all of us in here, that's probably a very hard thing and a hard concept to get past because probably we learned about 911 and it was only for emergencies. When it first came about, it was only for emergencies. But here in Mount Prospect and here in the Northwest suburbs around us, Arlington Heights, Elk Grove, uh, Palatine, Hoffman Estate, Streamwood, all that fall under, and there's more than that, but all that fall under our Northwest Central Dispatch Systems, which is our 911 center. We call police, we call 911 for that police service here in Mount Prospect. That's how we're going to get. If you need a police officer to come to where you're at, it's 911. We can text to 911. The preference always is to call if you can. Voice call is so much more important because we get more information from that phone call. We can hear, our dispatchers can hear the tone of your voice, what's going on in the background. They also get information as far as uh, that phone uh, subscriber or the owner of that phone. If it's a landline phone, which I know there's not a lot of them out there anymore, but if it's a landline phone, they get the exact location of that. If it's a cell phone, they're going to be able to triangulate your signal um, to about a block radius. So it's a pretty good way to, to figure out where you're at in the event that maybe you can't talk or maybe you can't give that information. If you can't call, if it's not safe for you to call, you can text to 911. Uh, when you text, the very first text we want you to send to 911 is tell us where you are at. Don't tell us what's going on yet, but tell us where you're at. That's so important because if that's the only text message that we receive from that phone number, we at least know where to send help. If we just get a text message that says help, it's gonna take that dispatcher and police services a lot longer to try and locate that person, but we will find it. We will find that number. It's just gonna take a lot longer and we don't, wanna, we don't wanna delay it any longer. So that's really important to know. Where texting comes in and where texting I think could be a really valuable resource here is in the event that you are in a, a situation like this and you're locked down, you're barricaded into a room, you can then be transmitting information to our 911 dispatch centers through that text message where now you are not making a lot of noise, right? We're not making a lot of noise. You're not having that voice talking and you can give that information, especially if you have someone in the room with you or where you're at or maybe yourself that's injured. That information is good to know because as Sergeant Tweedy said, as our officers and firefighters and EMS uh, personnel are coming, they're starting to prioritize where we're going and where we need to go and get help and help people. So that's really, really important. Um, and again, just to reiterate, if you do have that immediate threat to your life, you have that right to defend yourself and protect yourself. So again, have that plan ahead of time. So important, we're getting past that freeze. We're getting out of that freeze. Leave uh, valuables behind. Uh, I know sometimes that's hard to do, uh, but that's something that, again, valuables can be replaced. You cannot. Um, again, stay out of sight, turn out lights. That silence the cell phone one. I think that's so important. If you think about it, and if someone hears that something's going on, how fast does news travel nowadays? lightning fast right and think about it now you're now you're locked down you're in a room you're trying to stay quiet so it doesn't seem like you're there and now how many people do you think are going to call and text you right think about that just for yourself take a second think about how many phone calls text messages are going to be calling over and over and over and over again so we're talking about trying to make it so we're not uh not being able to be detected where we're at so cell phones are a huge thing as far as making sure that we're, we're being out of sight and not being able to be heard. If you can provide the information, please do. If you don't have this information, please don't make it up. If you are not sure, again, we want as much information as you can, but please don't make it up. I will tell you that as people are put in traumatic experiences, um, people perceive things differently at all times. Um, we have people that see things differently, colors of, you know, colors of clothing, all that stuff. So we'll get, re we'll get reports, uh, you know, 911 calls, not for this type of event, but just 911 calls that people will tell us it was a person wearing a blue shirt. And then it's, we get another report, it's a person wearing a green shirt. Maybe it was, you know, navy blue. Maybe it was, uh, you know, a different color. And we get there and that person's wearing a yellow shirt. 
and again, it's not, it, that's human, that's human behavior, right? That's perception. That is not anything. That's not someone telling us wrong. That's not anyone trying to throw us off the scent. It's just what human nature is, right? It's human behavior. So if you have this information, you can provide it, please do. Um, it's valuable for us, but obviously we understand that all that information that we are getting in, we're going to have to go through and know that it might not be it. So just be aware of that as you're, as you're going ahead and giving these. So I'm going to hand it over to Detective Shaps now. All right, so Greg really gave a great presentation there. And can we stop an active shooter event? Obviously, we know that we can. We watched that video. Everything he talked about, um, prevention is the best action, being observant. When you're a customer, when you're a client, when you're the employee, an employer, right? Paying attention and taking action. Um, now, my part of this uh, that I really want to hit on is the people in this audience really being proactive versus reactive. And I think that working in the school, I am the school resource officer of Prospect High School, I kind of have a different role. And maybe um, if we all stop and really start paying attention to the people that we know in our lives, right? Targeted violence can be prevented with intervention. And I was fortunate enough in 2020 and 2021 to attend the US Secret Service analysis of targeted school violence. So when I talk about these things, they compile all these statistics from 2008 to 2007 to 2018, uh, 41 violent incidents that occurred in schools. Now, again, this is to schools, but I think there are some really big takeaways in this training that I went to. Number one is that there really isn't a true profile of an active shooter. We can't say that it's a man, a woman, white, um, you know, Hispanic, how old they are. Are they 18? Are they 28? Are they 50? We, there really isn't a true profile. So these are the things that are important because I think all of us have watched on the news, right? Like after these events occur, um, they might interview a neighbor, right? And the neighbor might say, gosh, yeah, he did this or she did that. Then they might interview a family member. Um, and all these things that start like, yeah, in hindsight, there might've been these red flags, okay, that we ignored. But Maybe if school staff would have paid attention, maybe if family and friends would have paid attention. There's always a social emotional aspect to this, that if we really start paying attention to the people in our lives, we can intervene before people get violent. There typically is some kind of grievance or motive in these situations. It's not something that just happens instantly. This is something that maybe has been building up that's been, something's been bothering them. There's something going on. Somebody's making them angry. There's usually a planning phase. Um, I'm not gonna go into all the statistics with this, but in a majority of those 41 incidents that, you know, that happened, uh, they planned it. You know, a majority of them had a phase of this. So there are some behavioral indicators that I think if we were all a little bit more aware, we might talk to those people. We might say, hey, is something going on? Is there something that I can do for you? We might say, hey, you might need to go to therapy. Um, is there a mental health assessment that we need to get have done? I'm at the school, so there are these supports. And we know that, hey, there might be somebody that needs something. And it's if it's a family member, that might be hard for you to do, right? To really look at somebody that you love. If it's your child, I'm a parent, I get it. Um, but we know that as human beings, we all go through things. So are they going through something that, Maybe you need to call the police and say, hey, I think you need to look into this. And I'm going to go over a list of things here. And I just want you to think about it big picture, okay? Because this could be social media. What are they posting? What are they interested in? What are they following? What are they saying to you? Are they making statements? Are they sending emails that seem odd? Are they texting things that are odd? Just really big picture and being aware because I think if we get people help, we can prevent this from ever happening. And that is so important. And will we know the statistics on that? No, we won't because we got them help and it never happened. So it's hard for us to research these things, but I think that we can do that. So I'm gonna go over these now and just really pay attention. And I'm not talking about one or two of these behavioral indicators, okay? Because I'm sure some of us are gonna know people that have these things. I'm talking about when you know an individual and you see they've got four, five, six of these indicators, like, hey, I need to do something. I need to get them some supports. In the Village of Mount Prospect, we're very lucky. We have social services. We work with a police counselor. So if there's something where we need to get our police counselor involved and you need to call 911, we can do that. There are things that we can do to help people. So I want everybody to really think about who you know and could you use this. So uh, number one, 
Have you heard people make threats? Do they have an intent to attack somebody, right? Are they saying, man, I'm so mad, I'm gonna go do this. Have you heard that? Um, do they have escalating anger? Do they seem more intensely anger, angry about something where it's, it's different than before? It's growing, right? Um, the third thing, do they have interest in weapons? And I'm not talking about somebody that's like a hunter or they've got a couple guns. Do they really seem fixated on weapons? Um, are they sad, right? Depressed, isolated. These are the things where maybe they just need some medication. Maybe they need to see a psychiatrist and that's okay. These are the things that if we get people help, then maybe we can stop these situations. Um, have they self-harmed? Have they threatened suicide? And again, if you call the police, maybe these are things where we have responded for mental health issues. And we know now we have to get them this assessment. So maybe we've been there before, but if you don't call again and say, hey, there's these red flags. Um, and again, an interest in violence. Are they watching violent films? Are they really fixated on this? Are they posting things about this? Uh, talk of being bullied. Now, again, this was at school. These, my research was out of school, but when you think about this, right? Even when we see like shooters that go into places of employment, were they picked on? Were they the butt of the joke? Were they the one that wasn't performing well? I mean, this can happen with adults also. This isn't just children. Think about those things and um, concerns about grades and attendance. That's the school part. But what about if they're not performing well at work? What if they're not meeting their duties? What if they didn't, you know, their deadlines? What if they're not selling what they need to sell? I think all of these different things can come into play. And then have they turned to harassing others? Are they the ones that are now bullying people? So I think if we pay attention to these things and really like offer the help, um, we could really stop a lot of the violence that's there. We know there are red flags. Uh, pretty much in all of these things, when you see it, there's somebody who says, yeah, this, this really did throw me off. I was confused by this. So I just want everybody, again, pay attention to the people in your life, the people that you love, and think about those things. And if you need to call the police, please do that and let us investigate. Okay. That's my part. I that's the end of it. And I think um, one of the, oh, you went back. Um, I think one of the most important things of this and what all the officers that have presented um, tonight is really we're looking to empower everyone. We're looking to empower you to take that, uh, take this on to yourself. And what we mean by that is, again, getting, getting around and taking a look and seeing and starting to plan and prepare so we can make it through. Having that positive mindset when we're talking about surviving active shooter or active killer type events is so important when we, when we go through this. Having that mindset like they had in the video, you are going home tonight. You are going to see your loved ones. That is so important. The, the mind is such a powerful thing that we have. And survival is taking those steps and empowering you to do that, empowering you to say, I'm going to survive. I'm going to make it. And that's so important when we talk about this. Um, I think we covered a lot here. Um, I know that sometimes there, there are questions that come up with this. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to take some questions uh, from those in the audience here, as well as those that, that might be uh, watching at home. We're going to do our best. Please understand, if we don't uh, get to your question, um, you know, we will definitely try. Like I said, we'll stick around afterwards. We'll make sure that uh, your questions are answered. That's really what we want to do here. We want to make sure that you guys are, um, you know, obviously uh, prepared, and that's what we're looking to do. So does anyone have a question? If you have a question, please don't ask it yet. We're going to bring the microphone around uh, and give you that opportunity to ask a question just so those at home can hear it as well. I think I've recently heard that there's a 988 number, and would that be a better number to call the 911 if you can make the distinction? Yeah, great. So the question was as far as a 988 number. So the 988 number is a, a national number that has now come online uh, middle of July, I believe, for uh, uh, mental health for crisis. It's a crisis hotline. So so it's a crisis hotline. So 911 is still what you're going to use to get that police response. But if you have, uh, maybe if you're experiencing like uh, Detective Shaps talked about, you're seeing some warning signs, you're seeing some concerns, um, you know, using that hotline, that 988 number, to be able to get that help. There's support services. Again, if you're someone that um, is living with someone that is going through a mental health crisis or uh, has 
concern or you have concerns about mental health, that is definitely something they have resources through there as well. So don't think that it, you can't call it if it's not you, if it's someone else, um, that is something that you absolutely can use. But 988 is not an alternative to 911. Um, it's if you're talking about, we're talking about a crisis hotline, that's the number that we're going to use instead of using that uh, 10 digit number that there used to be. Um, it's now you can use 988, but 911 is still to get that police response, emergency response. Um, all right, we're going to, I'm going to kind of just jump around here. Uh, yes, regarding uh, the uh, recent uh, shooting in Highland Park, uh, from what I understood in the news and other available media, that uh, the uh, shooter had gone on uh, public uh, social media and had clearly indicated uh, that uh, once again, he showed all these signs of mental instability and actually threatened uh, to uh, start shooting people. And I'm just wondering why no one seems to have noticed any of this, because from what I understand, it went on for a, a considerable period of time before he actually committed the crime. Uh, do you have any uh, input into this, sir? Anyone want to take that or do you want me to? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, ultimately, um, the, the warning signs like we kind of talked about were there. Um, and in hindsight, yes, we can find all that. So a lot of times with these situations, there are pieces to the puzzle that people see, um, especially if you have someone that is posting this and, um, you know, testing the waters, maybe I'm going to post this, I'm going to share this, I'm going to say this through social media. Um, that's where as law enforcement, as mental health professionals, um, as communities, we're trying to definitely connect those dots sooner, as quickly as possible. That's where everyone's uh, uh, we're asking everyone to take part in being that, uh, you know, being that safety net, being that assistance. Um, you see it. We want you to report it. You, you know, we're going to look into that. We're going to investigate that. Um, I know when we talk about like uh, when it's something involving schools and I know Detective Shap says, right, those are things that we look into. It's not like it's just, oh, it's not something important. That's something that's definitely investigated to its fullest extent at that point. The, the one big thing that we say at the school is if you see something, say something not to ignore these things because like you're saying he did post th these things why didn't anybody alert the police why didn't anybody call 911 when they watched that why why didn't we know and i think another big part is trusting your instincts right if something happens and you're like ooh the hairs on my I, on my neck are standing up that seems weird maybe you should do something maybe you should say something if it's someone that you love hey i saw this you know why did you do this why did you why are you saying this do I need to get you help? I mean, that's the part of it where we really need to intervene. And most of the time when there is violence like this, the active shooter, this is like the last ditch effort. This is their last thing. Like there is a grievance, there is a motive. And this is the last thing they're gonna do. It's not the first thing they do. They've been boiling, things are going on. So really it's paying attention to all of these people in our lives. Like you're saying, if that was on social media, why didn't we say something? Well, my question would be to like everybody that knew him, why didn't they say something? And that's where every single person can be a part of this. And that's how we can prevent these things. Do you wanna go to another yeah. question? Let's see if I can bring oh, it. <laughs> no worries. Okay. Um, so I'm just curious about like the school um, part of it. Like, I, I understand everything of like, you know, if you're in a grocery store or anything like that, but like, as a teacher, I guess, being responsible for other lives, do we run? Do we hide? Um, what do we do? <laughs> what do we do? Because I, yeah. Did you want to? I can if you want. Okay. <laughs> um, so again, obviously, if you have a, a role, a teacher or daycare or anything where maybe you have a role and you have a responsibility, ultimately, that is something that again, that is a responsibility that you have. So, um, you know, what I would encourage is, you know, you can depending on the age of your kids, like you can have the conversation age appropriate, obviously, of, hey, there might be a time where we need to move and we need to leave the building, we need to get out. 
and it can be a fire, it can be an emergency. I, had, I was just at a school recently where they, uh, they described and said, you know, a teacher had said, what if there's a, you know, a wild goat running down the hallway? We might not need to hide out or get out of the building potentially. So again, as, as educational professionals, obviously um, your, your ability to provide that information and, and share is at age appropriate level, I think is, is gonna be that something that's so important. Those kids are gonna look to you or whoever's in your, you know, if you're there with a family member, right? If you're there with your family members, um, they might look to you. And and again, that responsibility, is that your responsibility? Well, obviously if, if you know, something is at a school, I would say that, you know, again, you probably have that responsibility to make decisions thinking with the children. Maybe you have the really little kids and knowing that, I'm not gonna, we're not gonna be able to really run that fast because we've got really little kids. So your decision might be a little different than someone that maybe has middle school or high school age kids that they're, that they're a teacher for, right? So again, the situation that you're in could determine some of your options that you might have or might, might change your decision as far as what response you might have with the information that you have. And I know I know that's a, a tough one, but really it's it's that thing where again, you have to take it at that moment and say, what do I know? What can I what can I tell? What can I see? What can I smell? What can I hear? All that information taking in and saying, okay, what decision are we going to make? And maybe you're going to look and say it's not you know, it, it, we can't get out, you know, it's a long way down to the hallway. Maybe it's not safe. We don't know. I don't know enough. And we can, we can make a decision based on that. But yeah, that's, that's something it is. It is a tough one, but that's where you get those kids, you know, prepared. I'm not talking about showing them the video and saying this could happen kids, right? We're not talking about that. We're talking about age appropriate as a, as an educator, as someone that's, you know, responsible for people, you work with those people, you can, you can identify and say, all right, Hey, there might be a time I need you to follow me. I need you to be quiet. I need you to listen. And, um, you know, we do talk in our schools here in Mount Prospect, we do talk with with teachers and staff about um, about this, about responses, um, making sure that they can they can be prepared talking about, you know, you might be in a uh, situation where you're staying in your classroom and thinking ahead and planning and saying, OK, I've got little kids. How am I going to keep them as calm as possible? How am I going to keep them um, where their voices are lower? Um, you know, and, and I've had some teachers that say I get a bag of uh, suckers. And I've got that bag of suckers, right? And so now that gives them something to do as opposed to talking, hopefully. Now, as some of you guys might know, and I have children myself, like sometimes they still talk with a sucker in their mouth. But again, at least it's maybe a little something, right? Or books or activities, something to help keep quiet. So those are things that you can even start thinking of and pre-planning that way as well. All right. Um, we're going to, yeah. Oh, you got another one? Oh, you had something to add? Sorry. No, that's okay. <laughs> so you brought up a, a great point. And the four of us and the officers in back here, obviously by what we're wearing, we signed up for this. I mean, this is our job. This is what we do. We are going to go in. But you folks didn't sign up for this. Our teachers, this isn't why you teach kids is to encounter these situations. You know, you work at a law firm and, and someone comes in, an active shooter. You didn't sign up for that. That's not what you took this job for. So we appreciate what you have to go through and we're here to help equip you. You know, we are referred to as first responders, but in these situations, we are not the first responders. It is our teachers, it is people that are shopping, it is people that are working in a cubicle that hear an active shooter coming. You are the first responders and that's why we're having these conversations. And like Greg said earlier, this is nothing to be taken lightly and we appreciate that you have to go through this. And so we're here to help you and to go alongside of you. And I'm so grateful again that you are taking this seriously. But we know that this is not what you signed up for. But unfortunately, because some very evil people are out there, this is the reality. And through this, we've all seen these incredible testimonies of teachers that have done heroic things to protect their students. We've heard testimonies of students high school students that have stepped up and they have defended and they have taken out people. So the opportunity for the heroic does exist, but we know that again, you didn't sign up for it, but this is unfortunately the reality that we're dealing with. All right, we're gonna actually, we've got some online questions. So we're gonna, we're gonna try and trade off and ask an online question and then uh, back in person. So we had a question about, um, 
what's the role of the police counselor um, in saying that they're not familiar with it? So obviously um, we have a human services department here in the, in the village of Mount Prospect. And I know I'm not on camera, so you can't see me at home, um, but uh, we have our human services department here in the village of Mount Prospect. One of those, um, one of those police, uh, one of, I'm sorry, one of those social workers is assigned to the police department and actually a second police social worker uh, slot is there and they're working and filling that as well. Um, so they're there to work and uh, connect with services and obviously provide services to uh, residents, um, anyone that is coming in contact with with uh, police, with 911, with emergency services, um, they work integrally with uh, with our police department. Uh, and again, there's that constant communication. It's that teamwork partnership to obviously provide what we can um, to our residents. And then obviously, if there is anything that goes above and beyond, um, again, connecting people with services, uh, even if it's not Mount Prospect, you know, we want to get people the help. We want to provide them with that support, with that care that we can. I have some mental, uh, some of our social workers here, so I just they gave me a thumbs up. All right, uh, let's go to an in-person question again. Um, where do you got? Right here. All right. Um, I just had a question. We hear a lot of stories with these situations in the news, um, and occasionally you hear the heroics of the good guy with a gun. When you come across a situation like this and you run into an active situation, how do you tell who's the good guy with a gun and who's the bad guy with a gun? Anyone want to take that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, that is an excellent question. Um, so how do we tell when we get there? Who's the good guy and who's the offender that we're looking for? Uh, could be any number of things. Something we do with the police is uh, that we train is uh, something we call sit, uh, situational awareness, something we've been talking about tonight. We're looking for a uh, body language cues. Could be something as simple as they match the description of the suspect. But as Officer Sill was talking about, uh, sometimes under stress, our mind will uh, put some different things together that might not always be accurate. And so we might not have an accurate description. So what we're looking for our uh, behavior cues. How is that person behaving when they, uh, when they see the uniformed police officer? What are they doing? How are they behaving towards the other people on scene? Um, are they being aggressive towards them? Are we, gonna, are we catching them in the act of shooting? Um, that's, in the, those officers on scene, they, uh, this is something that we do on a regular basis as part of our patrol is uh, looking for body language cues and behavior clusters to let us know is somebody up to uh, criminal activity or is it uh, just a member of our community going about their day. So we, we have to apply that. It is challenging to do under stress. Uh, one of the things that we talk about is uh, and that they talked about in the video is keeping your hands free. If you are that concealed carry holder and you think the best course of action is to pull your firearm and intervene, that is perfectly okay. That's, that's your constitutional right. Um, a good recommendation would be to not stand over that person with the firearm, holding the gun, waving the gun around, uh, keeping the gun in your hand. Uh, what we recommend is if you've uh, addressed the threat and that shooter is no longer a threat to us and you know the police are coming, to reholster that weapon, reconceal it, and keep your hands up for us. And then you can identify to us, I'm a concealed carry holder, uh, I intervened. And then our officers that are on scene can help, uh, we'll be able to process that a, a little bit safer. I left one of the mics up here. So we did have a question, again, we're kind of flipping back and forth. Uh, so we did have a question from someone at home about um, how we train with our schools here in Mount Prospect, because I know that came up. Uh, so in Mount Prospect, we do uh, train with our schools as far as providing information. Uh, all of our schools here in Mount Prospect do have uh, crisis plans to deal with emergencies. We work with our schools, um, you know, in and out as far as making sure that they have that plan. There are state laws that require them to have certain things, but obviously we, we want to make sure that we're going above and beyond to make sure we're keeping our, our students and our, our staff and our community as safe as possible. So we're always working towards encouraging, um, you know, what we can from the schools, making sure that they're thinking of that safety first. I know schools, school districts in Mount Prospect go through um, separate security audits that they do on their own a lot of times, looking for how they can obviously work to better, um, you know, make sure that the school is safe and those students are safe. So there are plans in place for our schools and school districts. We work uh, closely with them um, and we're always trying to, you know, we're always available to come in, talk with staff, talk with students, um, making sure that again, we're sharing the information because we want to empower everyone to make sure that they know, hey, in the event that something does happen, we want to make sure that we're, we're, um, we're giving everyone the, the tools to be able to do that. So, so um, 
in a situation like this, obviously you're going to be, your fight or flight system is going to be overwhelmed. So do you have any tips or suggestions on how to like calm yourself down to the point where you remain alert and aware rather than like overwhelmed and freaked out type of thing? <laughs> Thank you. That's an excellent question. I can uh, share with you what we, uh, we train our officers on and uh, what they use. Uh, it's a it's a breathing pattern. So uh, when you when you are under a lot of stress, uh, you feel that anxiety or that fear. What happens? Your heart rate increases. Your breathing becomes more shallow. Um, those are all uh, survival systems that your body does. If we want to calm down or bring ourselves back down, so we can, uh, I should say, the other thing that happens when we do that is how is our uh, cognitive processing and our decision making when we're super stressed or scared? It's not always the best, right? If we want to try to bring those uh, those systems of our body back down to bring ourselves get ourselves a little calmer so we can uh, re-engage our, our rational mind and start uh, thinking through and problem solving. Uh, one of the things we teach our officers to do is a four count breathing method. What you do is you would breathe in for a slow count of four, uh, hold that breath for four, breathe out for a slow count of four. Um, so then we'll start that cycle over again. We're gonna continue to do that cycle on a regular basis. And what you'll find is as you're, you're bringing more oxygen in to the, to the body, uh, your body's gonna start to calm and it's gonna start to move out of that, uh, that panic and fear stage and bring you back down, able to uh, re-engage your uh, cognitive mind and uh, start processing stuff a little bit easier. The other thing is mindset. There is uh, mindset is a very powerful tool. If anybody's ever had any kind of serious medical emergency, the power of your mind and and dealing with that makes a big difference in, in how you recover with a lot of things. Uh, we teach our officers and I wanna pass on to all of you as well, the mindset that you will survive. No matter what happens, you will survive. You deserve to survive, you will survive. If you have that mindset that no matter what happens, I'm gonna come out of this okay, I'm gonna get home to my loved ones and my family members and I'm gonna see them and nothing is gonna get my way of doing that. That type of mindset, that is a very, very powerful tool to, uh, to help you uh, succeed in a situation like this. All right, um, we had another one from at home again, just trying to, to bounce back and forth. Um, we had one that the question was, if, if that opportunity to, to leave or go outside, is should we be doing that or should we be staying in? Should we be locking ourselves down or barricading ourselves up? So obviously, um, as these situations are very fluid, we can't tell you one thing is gonna be that end all be all to keep you safe. So that's why we're looking to, to give you these options to empower you to make that decision. Um, we can't tell you, you can't have anyone else necessarily around you tell you what is going to be that best option at that time. It's gonna have to be that individual decision for you. Um, maybe getting out and away from that, right? We talked about avoiding, right, through that through that video. So avoidance, getting away from that problem, time and distance, that's going to be statistically the best that we can to keep ourselves safe. But obviously, it might not be safe to get out. It might not be safe to at that moment. So we might have to stay in. And really, it could be ever-changing to some degree as well. You might make the decision, I'm getting out. I'm going to get out, and I'm going to leave this room. And you get out into that hallway, and you realize that, hey, something's changed and more information's coming in and it's no longer safe to be out in that hallway. It's no longer safe to try and get out. And I might have to retreat back into the room. I might have to duck into somewhere else. I might have to take a different course of action. And so that's where, again, as we talk about these situations being fluid, we wanna make sure that, that we understand that these options as we go through, while we kind of went in sequential order or went down the list, know that they can be applied and they can be moved around. So there's no steps. I know that's always what we want to hear. Give me step one, give me step two, give me step three to stay safe and I'll follow, right? Um, but ultimately in these situations, we don't have that. That ability is not there. Anyone want to add anything? That Okay. Um, all right. Why aren't we allowed to carry our weapons into the schools, into church, into malls, into theaters? We have. We both have a CCW license and we are seniors. We can't run like all these young people here. We can't climb like we used to. My husband doesn't hear well, so he wouldn't be able to hear any commands. All we would have to do was fight. And that's why we carry a CCW. So why aren't we allowed to go to the stores? They did. They just had that killing in that grocery store. There were 10 that were, were killed. I mean, why can't we carry our weapons then into these buildings? That's what, that's what, 
That's I'll what I want. Maybe you're, you're you're really really want. Touch and that. anybody you want? Uh, it's fine. Yeah. Really? I mean, we even have a flight from Florida. We have the CC dollars. That gives us thirty degrees out here. As I say, that. It's an excellent question. It's uh, outside the scope of our capabilities as the uh, as the police department. So I, I, I would have to uh, direct, direct you on to someone else that we can couldn't address and, that for you. And and I would add on to that as well. And you know, again, you you, you commented about what what your situation is, right? So that's each individual. Um, maybe some of these don't uh, aren't going to apply as well. Maybe that option to run and get out isn't going to be an option based on what situation you're in. Maybe you're someone that, that you know, um, doesn't move that fast or anything like that or, or, you know, any of those situations. That's where, that's why we're saying this plan needs to be yours. These are some options. These are some, some availability to you. But ultimately, you might say, you know what, I, you know, I, I landed funny on my ankle and I can't really run. I can't walk. Um, and so I might decide I need to stay where I'm at because if I get out to start trying to run, that might not work that well. I might not be able to travel that fast. So those are things that, again, that's why we're empowering you. We want you to start thinking through this. This is this is a, a program that we're doing, and we're we're spending you know an hour, hour and a half of of going through this. But ultimately, this isn't at the end of this. The conversation doesn't end. The thought, the planning, the process doesn't end. We want you to have this be the start of it. If you haven't started thinking of it already, and I know it's awful thing, awful subject to think about. About. We don't want to think about this, but these, this is the reality that we're in right now. And while we can't just snap a finger and change everything that's happening, we have to take what we know, what we have available to us at this moment and start thinking through and saying, what am I going to do? What am I going to do to take that? And again, it's each it's incumbent on each and every person. If you have loved ones, when if they weren't able to make it, or maybe they don't live in Mount Prospect and they weren't part of this, you know, share, talk with them about it. Um, ask students, you know, maybe what, what they're told at school. Start thinking through these processes. Maybe start saying, hey, you know what, this is something that you might think of, you might be willing to do, you might be able to do. So those are things that we can think of. Let me see if we've got another uh, at home question. If you guys, if you want to maybe address one while I'm finding an at home question, if you want to find someone uh, with the microphone, if you don't mind finding someone. Chris, back. I think you first, you have to raise your hand every single time. Hi. Hi. Um, I just wanted to, mental illness has come up a couple of times. There is a lot of medical research, psychological research that shows that actually really isn't a correlation that people with mental illnesses are more likely to be stigmatized and victimized. So I hope some of the messaging kind of changes because when you look at Highland Park, when you look at Uvalde, when you look at the supermarket um, in Buffalo, hate and racism, those were the motives. Um, not mental illness. So I just really think, especially in leadership positions, we need to watch what we're saying and, and not stigmatizing people further. No, and it, and I know I've, if that came across that way, that wasn't it at all. I, I actually talked. Okay. Well, no, okay. I think that there are sometimes that people do need medication though. And maybe there is some denial. That's, that's all I'm saying. And there is the social emotional aspect of things. And that's what I really was talking about. So I don't think that there is a stigma. I think that there are times where people go through bouts of depression or sadness or isolation. I I understand. Okay, I understand that. Okay. Okay. Yes. All right, we had a, a question from, from home as far as like uh, situations or, or places like um, grocery stores or places where, again, you're not an employee, you're not someone that necessarily has an uh, a, a intimate knowledge of the building, like the back area. I'm not encouraging you to go in your grocery store and walk into the back where they, you know, have all the uh, all the produce hidden or anything like that. Like, don't do that and be like, well, I'll, Mount Prospect Police and Officer Sill said I can just check it out, right? So not encouraging that. Please don't misunderstand that. Um, but as you will go through, if you haven't noticed, as you go through, you will absolutely see there are emergency exits. You will see and start to notice these if you haven't. Um, they have those ways of egress. And you know what? In, a, in an event where you do come across something where you're like, oh, no, I need to go somewhere. I know there's an emergency exit all the way down there, but there is an area here where staff is allowed. It says employees only, right? When we're talking about being in a situation where, where safety, lives are at risk, right? 
at that, all bets are off as far as where you're allowed to go in, in really what we're talking about. If you need to go into that area where it says employees only, then you know what? You go in that area where it says employees only. When we're talking about an emergency situation, right, an active situation, that's something. But please don't be walking down, uh, you know, in the grocery store and just be like, oh, yeah, I'm going to check in back by, you know, back by the, the butcher, you know, just to see how they get out or how I get out. Um, again, not recommending that at all. I'm not recommending that at all. All right, let's see here. Uh, we're going to go right here. Yes, the uh, school in uh, Texas, the, uh, the uh, police officers were standing in the hallway for over an hour. Do you want to comment on that? That sounds like a training question, so I'm going <laughs> to jump up here with that one. Uh, yes, so that is uh, in stark contrast to what we do and what we train and what is best practice for us in law enforcement. Uh, what we train at the police department is we are going to move to the sound of that gunfire. We're going to move to the threat. Um, in that situation there, I believe the officer's initial assessment was that the, uh, the shooter was contained inside the classroom and they were interpreting it as a barricade situation. That would be, they thought nobody else was in danger. The shooting had stopped and the subject was contained. Uh, that turned out to not be the case. Uh, what we teach our officers, a uh, triggering event would be if we hear additional gunfire inside that room, that's a triggering event for our officers to then breach and make entry into the room. Now, I understand when the officers initially tried to breach, they, uh, they took fire, which is uh, not an easy thing to do. Um, what we uh, teach our officers is uh, we want our officers to be thinkers, too. They're not drones just going in following a set set of tactics. We have to problem solve that. Um, a couple of things they brought up in the after action report with the, uh, with the Texas school attack was uh, things like throwing a distraction through the window to distract the shooter, and then we breach, uh, breaching a uh, what they call like a spider hole through the drywall and shooting through the drywall to take the shooter out. There's a number of different solutions out there, but holding in the hallway and requesting additional resources is not something that we would do. As soon as we hear that gunfire, that's a triggering event for us to uh, actively engage that shooter. Excellent question, thank you. All right, we're going to, just for time's sake, and I know we're, we're running out of time, we're going to take one more at home, and we're going to take one more in person. Please understand, if we do not get to your question, um, again, we are not, like, zipping out the door as soon as this is done. Um, we just want to be cognizant of people's time, obviously, and the library staff's time um, for, for their amazing job that they've done to, to host us here. Um, so uh, one of the questions was, as far as um, in these events, in these mass uh, killings, uh, we have, obviously, if something were to happen here in Mount Prospect, we're not just going to have Mount Prospect resources, Mount Prospect police officers. There's going to be police officers and other agencies from all over the area um, coming to assist. And do we work through that? Do we have a system in place where we can um, obviously work through that process, not only with ourselves, which we've already uh, obviously covered and talked about, but now are we going to are we going to have it where you know, for example, Arlington Heights, and I'm just using them as, a, as an example, are they going to come into Mount Prospect and are they going to know what to do? Are they trained and prepared and all that stuff? And so that was a question that came up. Um, Sergeant Tweedy, do you want to talk about that? I don't mind if you if you want me to talk about that, but I feel like I've been stealing all the questions, man. I'm going to turn no, it No, no, go for it. You, you want to take it? No, go ahead. Okay. Um, so, so obviously, um, as Sergeant Tweedy was saying, um, law enforcement, there are uh, common practices across. We work towards uh, communication uh, in the area. We've got plans in place that um, I know in Mount Prospect, we train for and we work through. Um, I know uh, Sergeant Tweedy puts our, uh, our supervisors, our frontline supervisors through all kinds of training as far as being able to handle those situations where we have other staffing coming in from different towns. We do have that happen, not for... Uh, uh, events like this, but we do have times where we bring in staffing uh, through other agencies coming in officers. And again, we've worked through radio communication. We work through common terminology. Um, we've worked through all that stuff. So as they're coming through, um, we are going to be putting them in place and getting them into places where we can use, utilize them and get them to do. And again, because we're training across the board uh, in law enforcement, we're training with our um, responses and our rapid deployments and our rescue task force so yes, they should be able to come in, plug in. Um, and I know there are drills that are done by multi-jurisdictional agencies where when we have some of these uh, um, some of these training exercises that it's bringing in extra towns, bringing in all the surrounding towns. It's not just one town per se. 
Anything you want to add to that? Tackle a little bit on that. So uh, there is a, uh, a unified response system that we use. Uh, in Illinois, we have a mutual aid system called ILEAS. The, uh, I don't remember what it stands for, I apologize. But it is a, a mutual aid system where all the police departments in Northern Illinois, we can provide assistance if uh, any incident comes up that's greater than what the town's resources have. Um, there's a national system called the Incident Command System that is used. It gives structure to uh, bringing on towns and things from other departments, fire departments, public works facilities, federal agencies. And we teach our supervisors how to use that uh, incident command system so that they can bring those resources on, they can organize everybody, and they can properly deploy them out to the field to uh, resolve the critical incident. All right, let's see here. <laughs> there was recently a post from the Northwest uh, Dispatch about transitioning to an optical line. And if 911 didn't work, there was a regular number to call. Do you know if that transition is over or can you let people know what that number is in case that they dial 911 and they don't get through? Sure, absolutely. So there was a transition uh, from the old copper line to the, the new fiber optic. Um, from what I, the information that I was given was um, that transition had to be halted because um, there was some technical issues. Again, I'm not, I'm a police officer. I'm not an IT professional or, or phone service or anything like that, but it was halted. So they, they stopped and did not uh, do that transition um they're they're going back to the drawing board per se i guess if you will um but uh i believe the number is and hopefully i'm giving the right one <laughs> um i believe it's 847-590-3480 i believe is that 10 digit number so where that's also helpful is if you are not in mount prospect and you need to call 911 to get services in mount prospect that 10 digit number can get the get you to our 911 dispatch center. Obviously, if you're somewhere else, um, I know we've had situations where we've had people that have had uh, home uh, home security systems, camera systems, they've uh, seen on their home security system that someone was walking around their house, right? And they needed police response or they wanted police response to their home. Um, by calling 911, if they're out of state, that would get the 911 center for the, the area that they were in. So that 10 digit number is a number that they could call to get that. Uh, in the event that you don't know that number and you call 911, you can explain to that 911 dispatch center and they will transfer you to our 911 dispatch center. Um, I know sometimes that comes up um, like Displains does not share the same 911 dispatch center that we have. They are a different dispatch center. So we get the question, what happens if I'm in Displains? What happens if I'm in the border and I'm calling from my cell phone and I get Displains dispatch, you know, the dispatch center for Displains? Does that mean I'm not going to get the service? Am I not going to get help um, here in Mount Prospect? And no, you absolutely will get the help. They will get you in contact. They will keep you on the line. They will transfer you to, they're not going to, they, they're not going to say, hang up and call 911 again. And hopefully you get the Mount Prospect one, right? They're going to say, hold on, we're going to get you there. And they're going to connect you. They're going to get you that help. And then also for, for 911 really quickly, and then we, we are going to end the presentation. Um, but for 911, uh, when you do call that dispatcher is going to keep you on the line and they're going to be talking with you. They're going to be asking you questions. They're going to be getting information from you. Please understand that is not them trying not to dispatch police, fire, or EMS services. They are in that process of getting that information. They are plugging it into a terminal where now it is going over to another dispatcher where that dispatcher is then dispatching police, fire, or paramedic services. So while they're still talking to you, that doesn't mean that, you know, because a lot of times we hear people say, well, they kept talking to me and I, I needed to hang up so they could go and call the police or they could go and call the fire or the EMS. But please understand that they are keeping you on the line because we, we want to get as much information from you. We also want to try and provide, they're going to provide information to you. If there's a medical event, they're going to be able to walk through and give you some basic information to try and help in that situation. And then they also want to make sure that you're connected with those emergency services. They're going to keep you on the line until you can tell them that yes, there's a police officer here. Yes, the fire department's here. Yes, the emergency medical services are here. So they're going to do that so that is not uncommon that is absolutely the norm that they're going to sit there and they're going to stay on the line with you all right so we are just past time and like i said i want to be cognizant of everyone's time thank you thank you thank you so much just like officer beck told us said we really appreciate it thank you to the library one last thing before we go one last thing before we go I'm going to turn over to uh, Esther here from our Human Services Department. She is going to talk about a, uh, something that they have coming up, and she's going to share that information. Again, thank you very much. 
Hello, everyone. My name is Esther Salutillo, and I'm the deputy director and social worker for the Human Services Department for the Village of Mount Prospect. I wanted to quickly announce that our department will be hosting a suicide prevention community awareness event on December on September 21st from 4.30 to 7.30 p.m. at Village Hall. And it'll, it'll include a resource fair. We're going to do an awareness walk that will be under a mile. And also have two speakers that will be speaking um, about suicide and how it's impacted their families either directly um, or themselves, so lived experience. So please uh, tune into the Community Connection Center and the Village's Facebook page for more information on how to register. You can also find that information on the Village website. So I hope to see many of you there. Awesome. And let's give one last round of applause to the library staff for helping and hosting us. Thank you so much. Again, thank you all for being here. Please know, again, we're not running out the door. If you had questions from at home and they did not get answered, we, we are sincerely apologetic. Um, there is an email address on the bottom of the presentation. Feel free to email those questions in and we will address those. We will answer those as best we can. Um, we'll get them to you. So thank you again. Hope everyone gets home safely and has a wonderful night.